Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. Welcome to our webinar on what the boardroom needs to know about tax today. The presenter for today is going to be Raymond Gerardo, CFO and Managing Partner at TPA Global. Thank you very much, Gaia. Good morning to some of you. Good afternoon to others. Um, what does a board need to know is a, is a very relevant question in these days, I would assume. Uh, we are regularly being asked by people on the board, be it executive or non-executive, uh, what they should know about tax and how should they effectively manage the tax function. Uh, and to a large extent, we share with them uh, some of the slides that you will see today. Um, this is not going to be a tax technical presentation. Uh, it is more about a holistic, a holistic picture of looking at the tax function and the areas of risk or opportunity, if you will, uh, that board members need to pay attention to. So that's why the title is actually tax, tax risk management in that context. So if we go to the first slide, uh, next slide, uh, Gaia, please. Um, this is just a picture that for those of you that are in the tax world, you will recognize. Uh, I think you will also recognize that this list, list is absolutely incomplete. Uh, but what it does, it shows anybody that has to, to run uh, a CFO function, uh, a chairman of audit committee function, uh, that they need to start to get aware of all the changes that are being announced in multiple countries at multiple levels within supranational organizations like OECD, uh, the EU Commission, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And then it is becoming quite a myriad of all all sorts of interpretations, uh, all sorts of new uh, rules, some of them contradicting other rules of other countries, etc., cetera, et cetera. So it is quite a, a rapidly changing world, and it's an extremely difficult area to keep ahead of, uh, and to say the least, to manage. So if we go to the next page, what is what is actually happening in today's world after we have the BEPS reports released? Basically, there is almost perfect transparency. Some would disagree with me, but I would arguably say that one has to assume that any tax authority around the globe will have a full picture in quite a lot of detail of what your company or your organization is doing in the area of tax in particular. They will have a very, well, they should at least start to get a, an overview of what your economic reality seems to look like, because that's the way you have to present it. And they will be able to run a, a ton of analysis on these data points. And, and that's probably where the risk is starting to come up, because that's the area where tax authorities will start doing interpretations, some of which you already might encounter whereby they make up their own mind on what they think they see and want to see. So if we go into the next area, next slide, please. Um, what are they focusing on or what is actually for any board that they should start focusing on in the area of tax? Although some of us with experience already 10, 15 years ago would have said boards need to understand uh, you know, what is going on in the tax arena, um, some uh, tax people uh, also would say, we want to be much closer to business operations. There are still many companies out there where the finance organization, the board, is still not fully in line or understands what really tax is doing. Uh, but here, BAPS is, to a certain extent, forcing organizations to disclose effectively the governance structure. Who is making decisions? Where are these people sitting that make decisions? It is gonna be extremely important that any tax function with the support of finance and maybe even the board gets a very good handle on a corporation's operating model, its governance model, and that needs to be reflected in the way finance, tax, uh, and TP models are reflected in, uh, in in any reporting that is happening. If we go to the next function, what are th what are the other implications? There is a hell of a lot of focus on people. 
what they do, where they do it. So we have sometimes situations where we're told that the CEO of an operation is within a given country where we would like that CEO to be, but where the tax authorities are asking questions around, is that person there? Is he really doing his job there? Are the people that are making decisions, are they really local? Um, sometimes they even ask for bills of water usage uh, in the residence of the CEO and they come to the conclusion that it is just enough to flush the toilet for two times in a whole year. It's indicative that the person may not be regularly at that location. And what does that mean? So we're going to have all sorts of discussions around where people sit, what people do, uh, and what type of value do they create within the total organization. So that's the significant people function discussion. It also translates into the DEMPI concept to the extent it relates to intellectual property or intangibles. Who is doing the whole um, work around all the functions that you can identify in the intangibles arena? Um, so there is a lot of uh, focus on that. One very peculiar area is obviously the digital presence discussion, the, the action one of BEPS where action one is still not fully finalized, uh, where there's still a lot of debate around, you know, where the digital activity should be uh, taxed. Uh, and I think there's still a lot of debate uh, that will happen in the next uh, period before we come to any resolutions in this area. Uh, but these are, to a large extent, uh, the, the key areas to focus on. Uh, next slide, please, Gaia. This is just an illustration of where um, significant people functions or the people function as such will find its way. Um, in the master file, you will see a, a lot of debate around the people functions if you have to dis show the, the, the value chain of an organization. You technically should be um, allocating where the FTEs are, where the significant people are, also in the area of technology, uh, et cetera, et cetera. This is just a way to depict it. Um, there can be debate whether you, you have to go as detailed as this. Um, there is debate whether you can do a, a very high level uh, allocation. And it is still to be seen how tax authorities are going to react to it. But our expectation is that a lot of questions will be coming up, in particular, if you relate this value chain description in the master file with the country by country report, uh, whereas the country by country report, you do need to be specific about the functions that are being performed, uh, the, the countries where they are performed, etc. And that gives quite some insight for tax authorities if they combine the two documents. Uh, for a board, um, it is quite interesting to see how the tax authority is going to bring these kind of things together because they may not have yet made the connection unless you as a tax uh, person have been able to have quite some sessions with these people and to explain to them how it works. Next slide, please. Um, if you recap it, um, you know, you have in the master file the functional analysis the value chain analysis, intellectual property financing. The local file, again, needs to show the functional areas and management and how it interacts with other parts of uh, the group and with the country by country. Again, uh, the FTEs are going to be uh, mentioned in there with the functionalities of the country, companies involved and the countries where they're in. If you combine all these three documents and you give them to one and the same tax inspector, there is a lot of transparency available now. And they have even financial data to work from and come to certain conclusions. And, you know, this is what we are always referring back to the boards. All the facts are on the table. They can even see that they are maybe getting a very small part of the pie, whereas the next door neighbor gets more which triggers all sorts of debates uh, some of you may have already encountered. Next slide, please. Some may think that, well, it is not going to be relevant for me. 
because I don't have more than 750 million euros in, in revenue. But if you look at Holland as an example, if your local Dutch company, as small as it seems, is part of a group that has a global consolidated revenue of more than 50 million, you already fall in the trap of having to file a master file and a local file, which you have to create. Uh, clearly, also in Holland, if you are not over the 750, then you don't have to file a country by country report. But the transparency on the master file, local file is already uh, there as a requirement. Can we go to the next slide, please? Okay. So if I go back to what I said earlier, if you are now a board member and you think about what was it in the past, uh, at least prior to 2016, a tax inspector would find on his desk just the local transfer pricing document plus a corporate income tax return with potentially some TP forms that are specific to your country. If you look at what will be available after 2016, you see the CBC report I mentioned before you will see the master file, which effectively depicts the whole organization, the value chain and how the company intends to run with its intellectual property and how it finances its organization. You can put the local file into context because it also will have to reflect uh, a two sided approach, i.e. you will have to show also the other side uh, of your transaction, what that company is doing. China is going even a couple of steps further by saying for each and every transaction that we see with another group company, you have to give us the full value chain of that product or that service from start to finish, including the financial uh, results of those entities involved in that chain. And that basically means that per product or per service, technically speaking, the Chinese would be able to see everybody's margin, including your local margin in China, and they can make up their mind in terms of the functionality that they perform in, uh, in China and make their own conclusions out of that. <coughs> if, you, if you take the next step, uh, the next slide, uh, Kaya. So if you are now the tax inspector and get all this fantastic information, and bear in mind this is just an illustrative example, it is an example um, which has some very straightforward logical conclusions probably, uh, but we will see later that there is a, a, a way for the tax inspector to even make more conclusions based on more information that he has available. But if you just would look at this uh, overview on the left hand side looking at gross margins where the Netherlands is taking 33%, uh, the UK is taking 30%, uh, China is taking 17% and if you focus on that, if you look at operating margin which is the second uh, pie, you suddenly see the Netherlands taking 60% of the whole game, largely at the expense of Germany and China and if you then say, OK, but where are the FTEs? You see a lot of them in China, a very limited number of people in, uh, in the Netherlands, Germany relatively OK, and the UK. Now, what does this tell a tax inspector if this were to be uh, handed to the Chinese tax inspector? Clearly, he will need to ask the question, why is the Netherlands getting so much of the operating margin with so low number of people? And obviously your, your answer will be, well, the Dutch people are very smart and they are bringing a lot of value uh, because that's probably the only right answer to give in this particular case with this information. Uh, but if that were to be the truth, you will have to prepare yourself for that question and be able to answer it and prove it. Uh, through audit trail, et cetera, et cetera. Are you ready for that? Is that something that you can already do today for any given country that, you know, questions are coming up? If we look at the next slide, Gaia, 
This is um, this is an example drawn from the, the publicly disclosed uh, information by Rio Tinto. And we're seeing here a similar uh, approach where we say, okay, sales on the left-hand side, FTEs by location, and then where is the tax effectively paid? You can arguably say, okay, why is Australia getting 70% of all taxes paid? And, you know, we have sales primarily in China. And if you look at China in terms of how much tax is paid, there's virtually nothing. This will be, again, one of these trigger points potentially for tax authorities in China to start asking all sorts of nasty questions um, and probably other countries as well. Um, the logical answer in the case of Rio Tinto seems to be that it is a mining organization where a lot of the mining is taking place in Australia. And Australia is also levying, obviously, a lot of mining taxes aside from normal corporate income taxes. So Rio Tinto can probably bring the right arguments to play if these questions are being asked. But still, it just these kind of data points and connecting them with the activity of the organization can be very powerful for tax authorities in dealing with your organization and asking all the relevant nasty questions. If we go into the next slide, um, Gaia. To make things even worse in that sense, um, the OECD in September last year issued a document for uh, tax authorities. They issued a report and an advice, a handbook on how to effectively assess tax risks. What they have done is they have identified in effect 19 tax risk indicators which they can derive from the CBC report. I've highlighted here a couple of them in, in yellow. Um, and, you know, any good reader will understand and it's almost logic, uh, simplicity rules. Uh, but if you have as a potential tax risk indicator, the example, there is a high value or high proportion of related party revenues in a particular jurisdiction, i.e. you have a lot of intercompany transactions well, the chances of price manipulation, if you will, is then higher, or at least the opportunity for a company to do so. Now, clearly, just one element out of the 19 will not mean that that is the, the driver of everything for a tax inspector, but the combination of all these 19 factors together can be a very important indicator for tax authorities to work from. And what tax authorities seem to be doing is they seem to go through automation. You are filing everything in an XML version. They load it up in their computer systems, which they're building, and some of them might have already built it. Uh, and it is very easy and very quickly to run sensitivity analysis on these documents. So I think, uh, Gaia, I think we have a problem with the uh, slides now. I see slide number one. Okay, thank you. So if you look at um, number six as an example, you know, there is little activity, but quite significant profits. Again, this would be the example that we just saw uh, in, in the first one where we say in China, that lots of FTEs and, and a relatively low level of, of income. Uh, that's one of those indicators. If we go to the next slide, please. Okay, if you look at uh, number 12, IP is separated. So in other words, you have a special IP company. Clearly, there is an assumption of some tax planning going on, aside from the fact that you may want to own IP separately to allow it to be managed on a global scale. Uh, but still, there are, there are some indicators that would uh, give the tax inspectors some signals and saying, okay, watch out. And the logical consequence is they might ask you the question, uh, especially if they are in a, in a paying country where they pay royalties to that entity, they might consider it to be manipulative. If we go to the next slide, uh, Gaia, in here, uh, again, we have highlighted some of these aspects of how could they analyze these kind of uh, ratios. So if we look at number C, 
we see in the second column that we have 25% of unrelated party, which means 75% is related, which you see in the next column. Uh, the income per revenue, uh, sorry, the, the revenue per FTE is relatively high. If you look at the other countries in the same column, which is column number four, you see that 1.7 million is, or 1.7, yeah, it's 1.7 million. It's on the higher end versus other countries. That is a suggestion that, you know, there is maybe uh, uh, some shift in that in that area. If you then look at the very back end and you say the effective tax rate on that one is 15%, that might be interesting to have income in that country because it's probably lower than the group's average. And that's why if you're paying into this country from a given country, that might already be an indicator to start asking some questions. If you look at uh, the one that is in orange, which is country N, almost in the middle, you see it's even getting worse. 16% is only non-related, so 84 is related. The tax rate is 0% and even worse, the uh, the profit before tax over revenue margin is 47%. And that's quite a high number and by, by all means, uh, any industry that will have a profit before tax ratio of 47% of sales, that's quite a good business to be in, especially if you pay 0% tax on that and if you have employees, a low number of employees, where the employees are making 3.6 million per employee. That's a very sound business. Uh, but it is, to a large extent, it's internal. So these kind of ratios, and they are also combining these ratios in, a, in, in many different ways and forms, it can start helping with the support of computer analyses, tax inspectors, to at least get more inside of areas or companies where there is a risk. And that is a very easy way then to, to write a letter and say, can you please explain? Can you go to the next slide, please, Gaia? What does that mean? How, how can you as an organization deal with this changed world where apparently tax inspectors all over the globe are going to be almost on the same footing as you are in terms of information, insight on what your company is doing, how your company is doing it, how it is reporting that information. How can you effectively get, again, on top of this? We tend to use the word control, uh, be in control rather than having to do all these fire drills at the back end. Uh, that's a function of how your organization from the top down is dealing with tax governance and risk management in that area. Uh, if we go to the next slide, Gaia. Some of you might recognize maybe a picture like this. If you think about the tax function of the old days, and this is where sometimes if you think about board members, they may still feel, or the view is slowly but surely changing that department's role used to be maybe a profit center area where you had still a lot of possibilities within reason to deal with tax in such a way that you can help the organization to optimize its tax expense. Compliance in terms of cost of compliance was relatively okay, especially if you put it into a balance and look at it from a opportunity side perspective. So CFOs in the, typically were looking at the tax function probably more as a, as a profit center rather than a cost center. In our experience, and if we look at some of our clients, where, where has this gone? The world has changed drastically. Compliance has gone up dramatically. We all know that. We just gave some examples of that. And with compliance going up, and the planning opportunities going down uh, because certain transactions are no longer allowed, the focus on uh, people functions may hinder you more than ever uh, to, to do certain transactions or to do certain uh, restructurings that you would prefer to, uh, to, to set up. 
And that means that the tax function seems to be moving into a cost center area. And we all know what that means if a function is a cost center area, the tendency of finance, the tendency of the business is to reduce cost. And if you were to start reducing costs in the tax function where the compliance has gone up, it's not going to be an easy game for any tax director to manage that process. Now, that is exactly where also risk is introduced into a, a multinational, if you take it again from the view of the board, because they may feel that they are compliant, but they're squeezing hard uh, on the cost side, they may find tax, tax departments struggling to stay in control and to really manage everything, where they may underestimate what we just were talking about, the information that tax authorities will get the hand on is changing drastically the, the, the level playing field around information and thus the risk of an assessment going up drastically. So tax needs to stand up and actually start talking to its board or CFO and saying, look, we need more support. And the area of support is probably also in financial system support which is not necessarily the usual area where tax directors operate, especially in Europe, where you know tax directors are not always responsible for financial reporting, et cetera, et cetera. So I think this, this change can create conflicting, uh, can create a conflicting situation between what the perception is of the board slash CFOs where they want to reduce cost because there is not a lot of value created where the tax function actually sees that the risk level is increasing, the compliance requirements are increasing and they're not getting enough money to deal with it. To the contrary, the CFO might say, well, we're not bringing so much value. You actually have to get rid of people instead of getting extra people to do more compliance. So this is a bit of a danger zone. So if we start translating that into the next slide, please, Kaya. How can you stay out of trouble is what maybe was sort of the adagio of the past, where tax functions, maybe not uh, by their own intent, but, but maybe by the way of how tax uh, was managed by the board and the CFOs, you know, it was probably more of let's try to stay out of trouble, which means if there is an audit, start answering the questions. But, you know, let's wait and see uh, how we fight that. In today's world, maybe the recommendation to a board should be you need to be in control, which means that a tax department needs to be organized in such a way, a given such a, a basis for uh, for running the tax department that it can be ahead of the game and ahead of the game would also mean that you know the whole management of what information goes into master local file country by country and other transfer pricing forms you have to fill out to make sure that all these documents are all singing the same song and telling exactly the same story Absent such a control mechanism, absent such a uh, top-down management, you might find yourself in a situation where documents are not telling the same story, but they're all lying on the same desk with the same tax inspector looking at these documents and seeing inconsistencies. How can you have such a situation? Well, very often a master file might, I'm assuming, might be prepared by the tax department, that's fine, that's done centrally. The local transfer pricing documents are typically done by local people or even local controllers. There is not necessarily uh, always an alignment between the center and the local guys, which is very often a, a resource issue because tax departments don't have 20 people to do TP only. Um, the same is true for country by country. It's very much driven by financial data points to a large extent and some HR relevant data points. Where are they coming from? From the financial system and HR. And that's not something t 
typically run or controlled by a tax department. But somehow these data points are pushed together um, and next year they need to be done again. And consistency for next year is going to be a question. How did we do it the first time? How are we doing it the second time, the third time? Tax inspectors are going to be looking at consistencies as well. So if they see anomalies coming up, there is a question that you can prepare for. So again, here is the story. How can a tax department get in control over all this, manage all this at the same time? That's going to be the, 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 the critical question uh, we feel a board needs to look at and needs to facilitate for a tax department to be able to run. Uh, this does, does looking at your organization more holistically than just looking at the pieces that are underneath in every country. Um, that is what we call the value chain analysis, uh, but it is really looking at your organization as a whole. How is it operating? Where are the people? What are they doing? What are they contributing? And then to create around that the true story of what people do in terms of how it gets reflected in the master local file, country by country, etc., all under a central managerial control by the tax department. That potentially reduces the risk of uh, controversy uh, where you have disputes um, and may even help you to even stay further away from, from litigation at the courts. Can you go to the next slide, please, Gaia? Well, if you were to end up in controversy, and this is sort of, this picture tries to take into account a sort of a holistic view of how to, to be in control, if you will, where you see on the right-hand side, a very proactive approach. That's what we just said also for boards. Be proactive, be in a way uh, supportive of your tax department so that they have the tools to do proper analysis around the data, to understand the knowledges, be, be heavily involved on the uh, operational side and be an integral part of the, of the business so that they can understand what's going on, which is sort of the value chain analysis on the right hand bottom side, which is obviously a unilateral approach from the center. But still looking at these kind of things holistically will already be important. But other things that are obviously there are instruments that you can use that are made available. APAs is one of them. Uh, if you get into uh, discussions with authorities, is it the MAP? Is it the bilateral APA? Can you use the arbitration uh, regulations available to you, et cetera, et cetera? We tend to, to find that companies are now at the brink of having to design their own controversy, controversy management strategy, if you will, where they need to figure out, okay, how do we want to uh, deal with questions coming up, prepare for those? How far are we going? Do we want to go to, to, to ultimately into, uh, into the courts, yes or no? Are we willing to go and deal with uh, APAs or, or maps or whatever? Is that a strategy we want to follow or not? Um, it's all part of yeah, the new world, if you will, where the recommendation again is in dealing with your board is to come up with a conclusion around, okay, how do we want to manage basically any controversy that we get when tax inspectors are starting to ask questions? When audits are coming up or audits are running, uh, how do we want to make sure that um, we're not seeing one tax authority taking a piece of the pie, uh, which is effectively more than the pie, then how do we deal with that? Are we willing to go to court? Do we have to? It's a strategy. So that's, that's what we recommend. And every company has its own way of looking at the world, but it means get your support from the board make sure you have a strategy is basically the underlying uh, recommendation. Uh, go in the world of tax with eyes open uh, in a, in a forward-looking way proactively. If it's reactive, it's going to be a fight. Uh, typically, you're with your back against the wall. Uh, so it could also cost you a lot of money. So the wait and see approach that maybe was something that some of us did in the past is probably becoming more painful because tax authorities have much more information available 
and you will be haunted by that information because it's the information you have presented on top uh, and the analysis is what then is being made by the tax authorities and yeah that's making life a little bit more difficult okay Gaia can we go to our next slide what is then if you talk about board members and if you then have shared with them the information I've just shared with you holistically they obviously ask the question okay what should we do well this is just one example of how you can start looking at a function like in this particular case we we very quickly focus on the transfer pricing function within a tax organization and again this is not rocket science but it is something that we recommend gets done and it is about trying to understand what are the functions that a, a typical transfer pricing function should take care of what are the building blocks we have defined here nine building blocks these building blocks can also be translated into effectively a, a racing model uh, whereby each and every function has a list of activities underneath it which then has to be assigned to a number of people dealing with that and through that process which for a number of the people that are in finance are very very common where racy uh, structures and we will look at that in a minute where the racy principle is very much a, a a common denominator of how they organize how they hand over for those of you that deal with socks and have to do uh, socks reporting they will recognize that immediately uh, it is a way of managing risk it's a way of allocating the role and the responsibility to people these kind of ways of looking at a tax function in a more structured organized and a process manner will help an organization to centralize those decisions where they need to be centralized but at the same time it should also help using the resources that are available within an organization in an effective way by not necessarily having to increase the tax department uh, by 200 percent being able thus to deliver the whole storyline i was just talking about being in control of your data but you will be able to find ways to still use people in the finance organization people into uh, in the business organization in support of the centrally led uh, role that tax should still be taking in these areas if you talk about the TP side for, for a minute. So if we translate these nine building blocks that we have defined here into the next slide, you will see, and, and this is not uncommon for those of you who have dealt with, uh, with, with uh, again, as I mentioned, SOCs or controls, uh, those of you who have finance backgrounds uh, will recognize that if we we just look on the left hand side we look at okay there is consultancy activity there is the maintenance of documentation there is risk management uh, overall there is audit support etc etc each of these buckets can be further carved out in, in, in more detail. So if you take number one, number two here, the development maintenance of TP documentation, if you would look at the RACI uh, sheet dealing with that activity alone, you will find master file, local file, you will find TP documents, you will find CBCR, you will find uh, analytics, uh, you will find financial reporting if you have to report tax risks resulting from all this. So each and every sub activity underneath development and maintenance of TP documentation will again have a whole assignment of tasks of the person responsible or accountable, et cetera, et cetera, over each and every of these functions. And there you can still have, you know, the tax department taking quite a strong driving control function over the whole activity. Whereas using, as we have here as an example, group controlling, group legal, you know, local management, uh, people from the business team, and even external consultants. And via this way of looking at it from a process point of view, 
because it's very regular that you have to do it. It's every year. It, it's, it's an approach that can help you to manage your tax department and your TP department in this example more efficiently. But you can make it also much more visible to the board functions and your CFOs of what it is that you really have to do. And if you go and engage with them in the discussion, you will find that they will be able to help you tremendously in, in particular around data, whether it's financial data or uh, qualitative data. They have a lot of means of providing you with all these data rather than you go and search for it. Uh, but it requires a very different approach to for, for some of the departments dealing with, you know, their 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 finance organization and their and their board, but also uh, acknowledgement from the board that there is much more needed and that there is much more support to be given to the tax department. So if we if we take this picture and we look at, you know, the next slide, please, Gaia. How can you manage tax risk? The magic words, the way we look at it is alignment. And what do we mean by this? We, we use uh, the, the, the acronym of VCA value chain analytics as a sort of a holistic picture uh, where basically the whole perspective coming from the organization, the business perspective, which takes into account the, the corporate governance, the whole way the organization as a whole is uh, is controlled, the control framework, the policies and the way it's implemented to make sure that whatever the business does in the way it is run, where the decision makers are sitting, any policies that apply to any part of the business, uh, that that is aligned with the way we reflect the business into our master file, local file and country by country reporting. And out of experience now, we can see already that whatever people report in their financials may not necessarily reflect the truth around what people actually do. The example that I gave at the beginning where there is a CEO sitting in a certain country, or at least the way we report assumes that that individual is sitting there making all the relevant decision, having all the the value creation in that country where we claim he sits. But in practice, that person is not in that country. And if, if I would have been doing this, uh, this presentation in a live version in front of an audience, I would have shown you a, as a starter, a, a little video of the, the, the situation that occurred at Caterpillar a, a couple of years ago. And in particular, a hearing in front of the U.S. Senate committee where Senator Levin is actually asking a thousand questions, not just from Caterpillar itself, but also from its advisors, where it is effectively discussing a case where, yes, they created a lot of substance in Switzerland. They have about 400 people on the ground where they have moved quite a significant part, if not everything, of their uh, spare part business in terms of the the order intake, the financial uh, accounting for it, the whole uh, arrangements around sending it back to the, the, the plants for spare material to be delivered all over the world. But if you look at the functionality of the people sitting on the ground, and there's 400 individuals sitting there, you would arguably say in an old fashioned style, there is a hell of a lot of substance. There is no debate. But what is also true when they were looking at it, there were no or maybe minimal number of people moving from the US into Switzerland had any meaningful decision power and thus any meaningful impact on margins associated with that part of the business. And this whole setup is effectively being shot down uh, through uh, the hearings, through the IRS raiding the company. And what we see in that example, that basically the whole tax perspective in the way it was reported in, in, uh, in comparison to how the business is actually run, we see a mismatch. 
and just relying on financial reporting, reporting a way that we want to see it versus doing an analysis and saying, okay, where are really the significant people? If they would have run such an analysis and would have been honest with themselves on looking at that and saying, where are my decision makers? Where are my people that are the value creators? They no doubt would have concluded themselves that all these people have always been and still are operating from the US and that the activity that they created in Switzerland was merely a administrative support uh, function, maybe with some logistics, etc., but not necessarily the type of activity that you would associate with taking 80% or more of the margin of that specific part of the business into Switzerland. Uh, on top of that, it was even worse. They didn't pay for it, but they accounted. That. So in other words, Switzerland didn't pay for taking over that business from the US. And on top of it, it was taking all the profits out of it without having the functionality to support it. So again, alignment is a magic word associated with people functions. And I think for boards, and that's again, the, 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 the massive point that we try to convey uh, to them you have to get yourself on top of things and don't underestimate what the tax function is struggling with in aligning the business with uh, the tax reality of, uh, of today in terms of its, uh, its, its compliance requirements. Gaia, that takes me basically to the next slide, which is really a short summary. And I think from what you've heard so far, it is thus that compliance and transparency increase, where transparency is the key. Data consistency needs to be managed closely is, is a clear message, both qualitative as well as quantitative. Um, chance of detection, tax audit adjustment has just increased. I think tax authorities, we see more and more believe they have now 20,000 instruments more in their hands. Their toolbox has increased dramatically. Uh, the interpretations of each country saying that they have a lot of valuable uh, people on the ground and thus creating more value than what is uh, attributed to them is creating quite a, a, you know, an uncertain situation momentarily in a number of countries for a number of companies. Um, so for any organization, risk mitigation through proper alignment of the business operation and the tax operation is almost key. Getting on top of it, creating thus contemporaneous documentation and uh, the maintenance of an audit trail is becoming even more relevant than it was already before. And in that sense, the tax department's governance needs to be completely aligned uh, with everything above, including all the financial reporting, uh, probably including a lot more communication with the business, with the boards, to understand what tax is doing and needing in order to manage such a, uh, such a, you know, quite a top job. Um, and it is last but not least clear that tax as a percentage of sale is not a small number. And in my prior life, I've always been able to convince my boss uh, by saying, okay, if you look at my net tax savings, if we can talk about savings now, um, and if you compare that to a gross sales number, then <coughs> my number is quite relevant uh, versus what the business can bring as well. So it's not just inconsequential. With that, I conclude for today. Thank you very much, Raymond, for your presentation. And I would also like to thank all attendees for joining us today. For any further questions, please feel free to contact us, to contact Raymond. And uh, thank you again.